let's see if I can follow my own instructions on how to use the, the microphone. Um, I wanted to just start uh, by saying, if not now, when, if not uh, us, who, intentionally, because um, I think there was a lot that we learned in the context of the Children with Medical Complexity Coin State Team Projects, um, and also the network on the network level that uh, taught us not only about the importance of financial sustainability, taught us not only about the multiple challenges that we face in terms of financial sustainability, but also gave us some ideas for some new and different strategies that can be used um, in order to keep the work that is going um, going and to also spread it. So let me start by introducing the panelists this morning. We are very fortunate to have some very wise and experienced folks with us. Um, I'll start with Steve Fitton. Steve served in Michigan state government for 43 years, about half of the, in the Title V CYSHCN program and about half in Medicaid. He focused on policy and reimbursement issues, eventually becoming the Medicaid director for Michigan for over six years. After retiring from state government and a relatively brief stint consulting in a large firm, he has turned his focus to how Medicaid policy and financing can improve services and outcomes for children with medical complexity, children and youth with special health care needs, and their families. Kara Coleman is a lawyer with an MPH, and she currently works as a family leader and the director of policy and advocacy for Family Voices. Kara is the author of I Am Justice, Hear Me Roar, about her daughter, Justice Hope, who had multiple disabilities and was medically complex. She is the associate editor of Family Partnerships at Pediatrics. In the past, Kara has worked as an attorney serving low-income immigrants, a law clerk for a judge, a counselor in a battered women's shelter, and a case manager for homeless pregnant women. Um, she also said that I could introduce her as mommy. Um, turning now to Jeff Schiff. Jeff is a doctor with an MBA who is a senior scholar at Academy Health focusing on improving the outcomes for those with limited resources. He served as the chief medical officer for Minnesota Human Services Medicaid from 2006 to 2019. His portfolio included quality measurement, system delivery system redesign, and benefit policy. In measurement, he has had the honor of serving as co-chair of the RQ committee that created the first national set of Medicaid core measures for children in 2009. He has been involved in measurement development and measurement implementation. In delivery system redesign, he has been a developer of the Minnesota Health Care Home Program and the Accountable Care Organization. He's a past chair of the Medicaid Medical Directors Network and a past president of the Minnesota chapter of the AAP. He is a pediatrician and emergency medicine physician, and he received his MBA in 2005. Steve, uh, excuse me, Jeff is committed to creating an equitable patient and family-centered learning health care system. That could be said of all of our panelists today. So I'm going to uh, give you some remarks from my perspective, um, and then I'm going to ask our panelists, I'm going to turn to them and ask them some questions, ask them to respond to the statement that I made, and then ask them some questions. Um, in healthcare delivery systems innovation, initial financial capacity is often established through soft money, such as a grant or an award or a demonstration project, as with the CMC coin project. Financial sustainability is a critically important element in maintaining ongoing success, but the complexity of healthcare financing mechanisms, the multiplicity of siloed players, the longstanding reliance on uncompensated labor, including un- or under-reimbursed care coordination by clinicians and home nursing services provided without work hour limitations by families, the lack of clearly defined measures of value that are endorsed by all players, as well as the challenge of finding and sustaining the necessary political and organizational will are perennial challenges to identifying, securing, and maintaining funding to not only continue systems improvements, but to push them further. So I'm going to turn to our panel and ask that they uh, respond to that statement in about two or three minutes apiece, um, and then I have some specific questions for them to react to. So why don't we go ahead and start with Jeff. Jeff, would you like to share some thoughts on that statement? There we go. Um, thank you, Meg. And it's a pleasure to see people, some for the first time and some for the first time in a long time. And I guess I just have to say that um, it's an honor to be here with, um, as I think all of us feel. Um, 
I think that uh, to Meg's point, I think I feel less distinguished and maybe more persistent. Um, and I think that that probably um, is true for many people here. But I think that, um, um, I, I guess I wanna say that financial sustainability is part of a bigger sense of sustainability. And I had the honor of working with Meg and her team at BU and the people at Boston Children's and the MCHB folks on a part of this coin around um, the National Care Coordination Academy. And we adopted this three-legged stool model. And I guess I wanna say that sustainability needs to be part of a, of uh, of you have to figure out what you're sustaining and we need a model of care that works very well on that. And I guess I'll just, without getting into a lot of detail about models of care, I just wanna say that the models I think are where at the time now and after watching that uh, um, video where, where we know that the models have to include the communities we serve. Um, and we have to be able to return value to those communities. We need to be able to measure what matters in order to make sure that uh, that the model is actually proving value. And that those measures, I think we have now established that those measures include most importantly, family well-being and family quality of life. And then we need money that for two things. One is money for the model itself and to pay for the work and money to improve the model. And uh, the, and I think that that's really important. Um, and then just in general, I just have to say that, uh, that when I looked at that video and as I think about it, we make steps in an incremental, uh, in an incremental fashion. And after a while we can stand in 2022 and look back on what's been done, but it is one Medicaid program at a time. Um, one senator or representative at a time. So I think that that's really important. So I encourage us to be encouraged by how far we've come and to look at how far we are in the mountain, not that we're not at the peak yet. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jeff. Steve, let's turn to you next. Okay. Good morning. When I read, um, the statement that Meg put out there, I, I actually found it kind of discouraging. It's like, it's a complicated world out there. There are lots of challenges and, and they aren't easy. And, but I, and I hear the frustration in many gatherings, whether it's parents, professionals, um, even some policymakers about the, the sort of stuck feeling that, that there's this good work going on, but we haven't figured out how to get it into policy. We haven't figured out how to pay for it adequately. But I, I personally find this very frustrating because I think that making impactful policy to better support this population is eminently doable. It is realistic. And I speak a little bit from experience because I was the Medicaid director in Michigan when we adopted the Medicaid expansion with a Republican governor and a Republican legislature. And so I do have some experience in the legislative environment. <clears throat> and Anyway, I, I just think this is realistic and in a sense, we're almost psyching ourselves out. So I think we know enough to do this. And I say that, I think we know enough about the critical elements that are involved in the functions and the service delivery system in terms of what a comprehensive service is. If you look at the history of Title V, comprehensive services were in existence when I worked in the program in the 1970s. We had field clinics with social workers and nurses and physicians and nutritionists. And that has evolved because there's a lot more professional capacity now. But I think it gets overlooked that that's the history of Title V. And, and we, we know about that. We have enough evidence to be persuasive. And I think, I hope you'll find in your briefing package something that you'll find encouraging. The federal, Medic the federal Medicaid policy trajectory is supportive. The ACE Kids Act passed. The Family Opportunity Act Act passed in 2005, but the eligibility expansion is only adopted in five states. So part of this is you get the legislation passed, but you got to get it adopted at the state level. And the other thing is this is a very politically potent population. Legislators can be persuaded. It's obvious to them that there is a significant need here. But to get there requires 
I mean, this isn't easy to get done and I don't want to make it sound like it is. But I do have some suggestions for how to get it done. And some of this does come from Julie Beckett. She was relentless and she was relentless about getting her daughter home from the hospital. So it needs focus. And so it's easy to get distracted by broader issues. So if you focus on children with medical complexity, maybe you aren't so focused on the broader population. But I think you gotta decide whether you wanna get something done or whether you wanna worry about not addressing every social determinant or not addressing every need of every child. I think you can get, your vision can get too broad and you can lose focus, so you need focus. Obviously, you need a coalition of parents and providers, but also, I want to call out Title V because the Title V mission is to provide leadership here, to convene. And that's at the, both the national and the state level. But I think the ACE Kids Act is a wake up call because there is no mention of Title V. It is exclusively Medicaid legislation in the Medicaid Act. Um, and lastly, I think, you know, we do need to be strategic. And that means knowing where the lever, le levers of power are, knowing where the dollars are, having a relationship with Medicaid that works and understanding like there's a regulation and policy, and this is a little hook to get you to come to the policy workshop tomorrow, but there's a lot of Medicaid policy that can be supportive here. But the last thing I wanna leave you with is policy is never perfect. If you're trying to have perfect policy, you will never get there. And public policy is always imperfect because you're doing the best you can. And actually, you know, from my standpoint, from my perspective, you implement policy and then you see how it works. And so there's kind of this quality improvement refinement cycle that does occur in public policy. And that's what legislators are for and bureaucrats like me were for. So I leave you with this, but this can be done. We can get this done. Thank you so much. I feel like you were channeling Julie there uh, towards the end. So I appreciate that. Um, let's ask you to switch off your microphone. And if our friends over um, at the tech table there could bring up the slide deck for us again. Yeah, Kara's going to Kara's going to go next, but she has a video to share with us. All right, Kara, are you ready for me to go ahead and start the video? Yeah, I just if I can just do one line sort of introducing yes, what in the world I'm showing here. Um, so I thought, you know, continuing with the thread of channeling Julie, sometimes it's great to hear that from Mark Del Monte that that sort of hyper focused um, vigilance and persistence is really appreciated because sometimes I feel like this droning clock about the same things, which you'll hear me doing today. And one of them that I'd like to start with here is um, perhaps inspiration, but I'd say inspiration with some teeth that the fundamentals of teamwork that are at the core of family professional partnership um, are really described well in this um, clip from the movie, Here Comes the Boom. So play it, please. What's going on, Mr. Voss? Biology, Derek. Fair enough. Can someone tell me what happens when a cell stagnates? Okay, no one's listening to me. I will try again. Anyone know what happens to a stagnant cell? What's he doing on the table? I don't know, something about cells. Malia. It's not good. Did you hear that? It ain't good. People, a cell that is not in motion is not a productive member of the system. It ends up assuming all the other cells are gonna pick up the slack somewhere, but they don't. In fact, they imitate the stray cell until basically the whole organism begins to die. Yeah, but you know what? Biology is an amazing thing. And here's the good news. All that decays can be restored. It's just hitting anybody. Like how a cut heals. 
like how a cut heals. Brian, my man. Oh, you got one. <laughs> and once that cell is back on track, it creates energy amongst the other cells. That's what happens. It starts getting a little movement going. It gets a little rumble. Can I get a little rumble from everybody? Everybody just rumble in your seats right now for me. Just rumble a little bit. Okay, no rumble. That's fine. I'll be the lone rumbler up here. That's what I am. I'm a lone rumbler. But then the cell starts banging into the other cells. And the cells push back and go, hey, what are you doing to me? They hit him to another one. Hey, don't do that to me. That's my friend. You don't even know him. You don't know me either. I know you. We work together. Because then they hit a rhythm. They all hit a rhythm. And this is the beginning of the restorative process. So now, even if the entire system is close to dead, what happens? Martinez, come on. Give me something. Oh, no. Not today. Oh, no. Not in my house. No, 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 no. Look out. Here we come. Don't look up my pant leg, Derek. You're better than that. It's right over you. Come on, man. What do you say? If all the cells work together, what will happen? So, whoop. <laughs> so I guess really the, the, you know, the most important part of that is that question, if all the cells work together, what happens? His answer is, before I rudely interrupted, sorry, thank you for playing the clip, the system is healed, just like that cut regenerating. Um, and you saw from his dancing, if I was there with you in person, I probably would be doing a little rumbling and stuff. Thankfully, you just have my massive face up there on the screen and not me dancing. But, um, you know, in that rumbling he did, there was discomfort. And that is what we feel in the system. That's what we feel, you know, after the murder of George Floyd and the pandemic and the economic crisis and one thing after another and the frustration and the anger and the, you know, almost dead system that Steve mentioned as saying, man, this is so discouraging. But if we continue to fight in there as the cells, all of us cells, you notice when he's talking about the cells, he's not distinguishing, well, which cell has what credentials and what role and who should be on the team and what color are they and what ethnicity and what this and that. It's all of the cells and we're in there rumbling together and we come together um, no one is saying, none of the cells are saying, no, 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 that's not my job, that's your job. We are all doing it together. Um, and I think that fundamental is really critical and often we lose, we go down the line to the sustainability and the financials without forgetting and, or without forgetting, with forgetting who's on the team um, and you know getting all the cells involved. So that's my opening video and remarks, thanks. Eric, thanks so much. So you heard from all three of our panelists. Um, I have some questions that I'd like to ask each of them. Um, and then we're going to open it up and see if you have questions for the panelists. Um, I'd like to start with Steve. So Steve, the Children with Medical Complexity COIN state teams are justifiably proud of their many successes, but each had relatively small cohorts of children enrolled in their improvement projects. What's your response to the statement, we need to study X or Y with a larger cohort of children in order to really understand what and how to pay for it moving forward? Do you think as a network and as a field, we know enough to make a start? Short answer is yes. I think we know enough. And that's not to minimize the fact that there's you know, progress to be made and that particularly parent leadership and parent um, full participation and full partnership in the many projects that you have was a step forward and not necessarily a given. But this is, this is a process that's been going on for a long time. In Michigan, when I was in the Title V program, we hired a parent director in the mid-1980s. And I think Julie Beckett probably had a lot to do with getting that going. Um, and so, you know, it's been incremental progress, and I want to steal a phrase from Jeff, but he talks about, which is radical incrementalism. But I think that there is enough known to move forward so that you don't have to study this to death. 
and to create the perfect model. And it's a classic case of the perfect being the enemy of the good. You know, public, public policy, as I said before, is, is a process. And for those of you who read the paper, you know that public policy is imperfect in many ways. And it's a work, you know, it's a work in progress. And so, you know, there is some really hard work to be done. And some of it is, and, and so I want to call out the state of Texas because I think they've been doing some really significant work and they have a coalition of parents and providers and Title V that have gotten together. The Medicaid agency is being proactive about the ACE Kids Act and focusing on this population. They have a managed care product and have had called Star Kids that is exclusive to SSI enrolled children. So they really have um, they really have been moving the needle forward there in terms of I think some some proactive planning and development and and trying to bring that together. But one of the big challenges is that a lot of these models of services, even though they have common elements, are somewhat different. So what Ricardo Moscata does in Houston is different than what Rahel Berhani is doing in Austin, Rahel being the lead in Texas. And, you know, I don't think they're different in kind, but some of this is Medicaid is not built for one-offs. And I think I'm jumping ahead to the next question that Meg's going to ask me. But Medicaid is built for systems of care, and that's why they have HMOs and ACOs and whatever other flavor they've got in Colorado, RAEs and I keep forgetting the acronym in Alabama, ACHNs or AHCNs. But, but in any case, they're built for models of care. And so part of the challenge is just to get together enough to identify the common elements and the key functions that can be the core piece of a system of care that you can articulate policy so that you have a structure because Medicaid's about structures. And so, but I think it's, a, I mean, I think we know enough to move forward. I think that's sort of the key bottom line. And, you know, a bigger, a bigger study with more kids, I mean, there'll be some incremental learning, but, you know, do we really need to know that to move forward with policy? And my answer is no. Steve, thanks. A question that I'd like to pose to the audience and, and just have you think about right now is, um, in terms of the small cohort that children uh, that the children with medical complexity state team projects had, if we were able to make progress with that small number of kids in the midst of a public health emergency, a pandemic, imagine what we could do outside of a public health emergency. So just let's let's contemplate that a little bit and see if, if folks have thoughts about it as we move forward. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for for that um, helpful response. Kara, uh, I mentioned in my opening statement that the numerous siloed players in financing healthcare innovations is a significant challenge. A strategy that you and other folks have suggested for addressing this problem has been multidisciplinary partnerships, including families. And I think we have some very strong evidence from the state teams around the success um, in using that strategy. What do you see as the role or roles of families and family leaders in identifying value and as a consequence, securing long-term funding for care innovation. What role can they play? So <clears throat> I think I have sort of layered and pronged responses. One, there's not gonna be, you know, quite frankly, identification or proper definition and measurement of value for children with medical complexity unless families are involved. And that's where I get to the prongs, you know, families involved on the individual level in partnership with their providers. And then as colleagues, emphasis on that word, as the family leaders that have been on each of these state teams, you know, solid a part of this, colleagues as, you know, members of systems transformation teams making change. Um, you know, and, and continuing the Julie thread, um, you know, like let's just step back and look at and sort of run that question through, you know, what is the role of families and family leaders in identifying value? Katie would not have come home if Julie hadn't stood up <laughs> to doctors and, you know, worked the chain all the way up to President Reagan. 
And that is true um, also in the work that she did to create family to family health information centers and other family led organizations. The infrastructure that one family um, leader then coupled together and creating this massive network of family leaders, you know, has created phenomenal value. And that has then been replicated, you know, now in the coin. Unfortunately, over the decades, sometimes in all of our excitement to move forward and stuff and to really dig in on partnership, we reinvent the wheel rather than working with the infrastructure we have. But something we've done in the coin is ensuring that on each team, there is a family leader from a family to family health information center and family led, you know, that are all connected and multiple family leaders um, building that sort of network and community of practice within each state team. Um, and what that's done in the coin in terms of identifying value and really making it, it come to life and, and measurement of it. One of the best examples out of the coin is that you know, when we were developing those quantitative measures for the survey, um, the family leaders, we all started saying, this really doesn't get it. And that's what the measurement work group said, it's missing something. And so you know, under your leadership, Meg, we took this big pivot and really valued the qualitative measurement um, that we could um, come up with, you know, for family focus groups and brought that in. And I guess that my last point there sort of harkens back to some of, I think, Steve, the question for Steve. And, and one of the sort of parts of it that was maybe underlying too is, you know, looking at the evidence base. Is there enough? Sure. Is it absolutely perfect? No. But often what it's missing too is the voices of families. There's certain quantitative data that we rely on. Um, and sometimes we leave out that qualitative data. And so partnership with families and research and partnership in QI and everything else. Um, so just broken record again for the absolute role. We're not gonna get to value if families aren't um, you know, involved as colleagues um, in any of this sustainability work. Thank you, Kara, and thank you for the plug, the, the maybe unintentional plug for the Family Driven Measurement Workshop later this afternoon. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, Jeff, let's go ahead and turn to you now. Um, a question that I have is, um, another critical element in sustaining financial support for innovative improvement work is leadership, especially in identifying value and quality outcomes. Who do you think should take the lead on identifying value and quality outcomes. Does it have to come from the state Medicaid agency? Should it come from the C-suite? Or can anyone who's passionate and committed lead change? What's the first step you'd advise someone who wants to lead change? Um, I think we're all leaders and I'm, any of you could be up here. Um, I'm gonna do something I didn't plan on doing, but I want to do it. Um, I, for a long time, thought of that I didn't have a kid with special health care needs. I have three kids, and then one of my kids got cancer. Um, so I always think of myself as the provider, you know what I mean, as the, or the policy guy, or that thing that's other. But all of us have kids we're worried about because they have a mental health issue, or because they are in the wrong relationship as young adults or they're, you know, or they don't, or they've lost their way. So we all are worried about our kids and I got the chance to worry about my kid as a medical person. I'm bringing that up, not because I want you to come to me afterwards and say, I'm sorry that this happened to you. He's fine now and knock on wood, you know, we're at six month follow-up, so continue to be fine. And, and I don't talk about it a lot because I don't think he really sees himself as he just sees himself as having had a, a short-term problem. A lot of your families have not. But I bring it up because leadership, I think, for all of us and everybody here has been about stepping out of our comfort zone and being willing to go to somebody and say something when you're not sure how they're going to react. And I want to, I want you to think about that not as sort of out of your comfort zone, but as a gift you give to the person who you're talking to. And, you know, we come really, people come to Medicaid and I was at Medicaid really well prepared with a bunch of data. 
and they come, you know, saying, look at this, we're going to save you, blah, 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 or whatever. And we get in, you know, when I was at Medicaid, we got inundated. We got that story. I could have done that five times a day, whether it's a wound vac or a new drug or something like that. So somebody could have always come up and said something about that. And I don't remember any of it. I shouldn't say that. I remember some of it. Um, but, I re but I remember the stories, right? You remember the... And so the leadership that comes out of this group is really about creating a team so that you can share those stories and you can hook into the people who you're who you're you're working with. I want to say that you know we think of Medicaid as a black box. Or I used to when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about how people from the health department, which is where Title V is in Minnesota, used to think about Medicaid as I think they thought we had a, a chest of gold coins in the, in the basement, and we were just really stingy about them. We, we were the bank. Yeah, you know, and the reality is there's the basement just had a lot of old computers and <laughs> and there were no gold coins, but there were rules and somehow the money flowed if we could get it to flow better. But I think it was always about what really helped, I think, most is when we started to create a partner a partnership. And so my thing about leadership is you got to figure out how to co-opt those people. And I was pretty co-optable, but, and most people are actually with the right story and the right data. I want to go back to the data just to say, and maybe this is where I'll stop, but to say that the data is never perfect, right? You know, we're never going to have a perfect set of data. So you got to go with what you, what you have. Medicaid, you know, there are a lot of people there who want to do the right thing and they operate with the best data that they have. And I think you have to both be honest about what data you have and honest. I don't think um, Julie Beckett had data that said, you know, if you leave kids in the hospital, they're going to do this. And if you take them home, they're going to do this. It was just the right thing to do. So the data has to be combined with some sense of ethics about where you're going to go. You know, there's lots of things we do every day that aren't data driven. And so we have to use the data, but we can't get so stuck on that, that we are afraid to act or that, that somehow somebody says you don't have the data and that paralyzes you. So I think I'll, um, I guess I'll say one of them. <laughs> and that's that sharing power create, you know, in a team creates a lot of joy. And purpose. And I think that we ought to, I think all of you who are here know that inherently, but we ought to just recognize and celebrate that. Jeff, I very much appreciate that last comment, especially. Um, I think it resonates uh, for, for our, our audience here in person as well as, as virtually. Um, my friend and mentor, Carol Tobias, taught me that if you treat Medicaid like the candy machine, that if you kick it, you'll get free candy. Pretty soon they get tired of being kicked. Um, and that's, I think, resonant of your commentary about it being a partnership, about sharing power, and that you know folks are trying to do the best that they can for kids and families and specifically Medicaid beneficiaries. They have different, um, they have different and sometimes competing requirements and agendas and imperatives. Um, the state legislature and the governor usually is weighing in with an opinion about things. Um, but if you treat them as colleagues who can potentially be effective and helpful partners, I think you're probably pretty farther down the line than, than you would have gotten otherwise. So thank you very much for that, those comments. Um, Steve, I want to turn to you and, and ask, what is your advice to a more local CMC program that has seen some success, some success in improving care delivery in spreading that innovation to other care entities, preferably statewide. Are there policy mechanisms within Medicaid, for example, that can be leveraged? And as you've said many times, Medicaid isn't built for one-offs. So how can the individual state teams here who have learned quite a bit from their own projects that were smaller scale by design, how can they help spread those to other care entities and and preferably within the structure of Medicaid so that it becomes uh, more built into the system.
I believe that one of the real um, opportunities is that there are multiple access points for moving policy forward. And so one approach here would be to approach the Title V, the Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs Program in terms of um, looking at the model and maybe trying to provide, a, you know, help to bridge um, creating criteria or making the model, you know, more broadly endorsed um, and bringing other clinicians together. But the other, you know, the other part of this, the reality is that many clinicians or leaders who would, you know, many of you who have been doing these projects and building a system have relationships with colleagues at other institutions who are similarly committed or could be committed, are interested in this population and know about the unmet need in their part of the state. And so if you're in Alabama and you're in Mobile, you know, what's going on in Birmingham and how can you create linkages and start to help to spread the model, assuming that you can gain interest. But you can do it through the Title V agency. You could do it through the Medicaid agency, potentially. Now, as Meg said, realistically, Medicaid is not built for one-offs, but they do have capacity to do demonstrations. And there are examples of, like for instance, I know Michigan because I'm from Michigan. I spent 43 years in state government there. So that's really my, my knowledge base. Um, but, and this was, Outside, this is more recent than my involvement, but there is an intensive feeding program that was created under the EPSDT authority that exists literally only in one institution at the Voss Children's in Grand Rapids, was in Ann Arbor and atrophied. But there's a provision in the state plan to do that, just to have that one intensive feeding program. There's a model there that could be adopted by other institutions. So I think there are multiple approaches to getting this done, but ultimately it's about relationship and connection and then just getting the interest and the excitement to do capacity building in, in other parts of the state and to take a public health population-based approach. I mean, that's what public health is, I think. I'm not a public health professional. I'm a, like a career bureaucrat. I have a degree in multidisciplinary social science, which my wife says is a bachelor's degree in glorified no prep. So I have no clinical expertise. But I've been through the wars of policy and financing Medicaid and in children's special health care services, which is what the program's called in Michigan. So, and Meg talked about wisdom. I just think about it as old age. But in any case, that's that's what I have to say. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm sticking with the wisdom. Um, Kara, I want, <laughs> I want to turn to you next. Um, we have just a couple of questions left for the panelists, and then we're going to turn to the audience and see if they have questions. Um, it's certainly an overstatement to say that our healthcare system is almost dead, but like the gentleman standing up on the desk in the video clip, uh, it ain't good. Uh, Kara, in a perfect world, what do you think should get paid for? And how could the cost effectiveness of that payment be measured from the perspective of kids and families? That is a ginormous question, Meg, um, especially since <laughs> What, what what Jeff and Steve joked about is, you know, Medicaid is not a bank or, you, you know, they're not a, a candy machine and stuff. So it's a little tricky. And I think I'd like to take my answer, uh, you know, first a little to that upstream again, you know, and building off of Steve what just, you know, finished up there saying about the importance of relationship again. Um, and also working off of a key word I heard in what Jeff was just saying about ethics. Um, you know, in your opening remarks, Meg, you, you gave the example of, you know, paying families for the care that they're providing, whether that's in home health care or perhaps, you know, as some sort of community health worker or something that, um, you know, that whole paying families um, and the work that families are providing, how they're pulled away from their other paid gigs to provide care. All of that kind of rumbling is really what I think is this massive pink, purple, polka dotted elephant in the room on the upstream of before we can get to any sort of sustainability and, and real teamwork um, and is, is acknowledging that 
the system forces families to provide this unpaid labor, often says they shouldn't be doing it, but relies on it, but doesn't always bring them in as colleagues at a systems level to redesign so that it is cost effective and the right things are paid for so that families don't have to pay or provide all of this skilled care, for example, in home health care that they're not necessarily trained or wanting to do or paid to do and all that. So I'm just, you know, jumbling and, and really sort of illustrating the, the massive gray area of this pink elephant, polka dotted elephant in the room of all that families provide in the system that is not paid for. Um, I think if you ask all of us, we would do it time and time again. I know for my daughter, you know, who is no longer with us on earth, I would, I wish she was here so that I could provide it 24 seven. But it's also just not right and fair and ethical that a system that has laws and regulations and data and all this stuff in place to, you know, provide home health care or to provide other types of care, you know, often puts it off on families without, you know, having them come in and re-engineer and make sure that you know, clinicians are reimbursed in the right way, families, you know, are providing the care that they can and should provide, and then, you know, are compensated for others, and the right people are all in place and stuff. So um, I think that unless we have some of those real discussions and have families in as colleagues, um, helping us figure out, you know, how we're going to design the system, we're, we're not, we're not going to get to, you um, you know, any of the measures that we need, um, and even, you know, along the cost effectiveness, I mean, what are we going to pay for? We're not always paying for the right things. And then what are the cost effectiveness of whatever measures we implement? You know, if we're not working with families on that, you know, and have measures that focus on just how many emergency room visits are we, are we um, preventing, which is really important, but it's not the end all be all, right? And if we're looking more at satisfaction than actual experience and measures of care coordination and integrated care, then we're looking at the wrong things and we're not gonna really be able to discern was the intervention cost effective and, and draw those red lines between everything and connect the dots to make that evidence that helps us move forward and maybe not perfect, but move in the right direction. Um, so I think that there's a lot of ethical discussions that we need to have up front um, as part of that bumping around cells working together that I think will help us. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to create the systems um, that are not sustainable for families, for family leaders, for clinicians, for any of us. We are in these paths of like shared moral distress that are all parallel. And we need to come together and share all that. So I went off on a lot more than cost effectiveness, um, but hopefully some of it showed how people think about things and, and be willing to have those uncomfortable conversations. Um, I'm going to turn the podium over to, to Jeff, who I think has a response to, to Kara's comments. Thank you, Kara. Yeah. Kara, I appreciate your comments. I just wanted to say one other thing. This is like a Title V MCHB meeting, and I also go to Medicaid meetings, and I think one of the things that I think we have to realize as we're trying to work together is that even if Medicaid wants to do well, and I'll just even say this, even if they have the statute and the authority in the state to do well, they may not have the resources to do well. You know, so it's sort of like this, okay, we want to start another waiver or we want to do a waiver application and we have to have the staff to do that. And who's the staff who's going to know that and learn it? And then how are they going to get the responses they need out of the families? And how are they going to write the rule in the state? And how are they going to get CMS to approve it? So I think one of the things we have to realize is that sometimes there's, sometimes there's unwillingness or sometimes, and we are spending a lot of time here talking about getting over that unwillingness. And sometimes there's just bureaucracy and how do we help the bureaucracy to move forward? And sometimes it's really good if somebody who's got that experience is in the bureaucracy, for example. But it takes time to get all those pieces done. And it takes prioritization. So that takes persistence inside. this one Because I think I was contrasting this conversation with the one of about a month and a half ago when we were at the Medicaid Medical Directors and we're talking about how to do these things. And it's much more about 
hey, we're going to do something on maternal mental health, but I don't have the staff to create the program, you know, or I don't have the, or how am I going to figure out how much to pay for this screening because I don't have a way to do it, or my HMO contract isn't up for two years, so I can't rewrite it into the HMO contract. So I think there's that sort of that understanding of the Medicaid side in a positive, like, I want to be your partner kind of way. So thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, thank you. The 10 minute warning from the back of the room. Appreciate it, Steve. Let's, um, let's go ahead and take a pause on asking questions, my asking questions of the panelists, and instead uh, turn it over to the audience here in the room as well as the audience virtually. Um, Jessica, would you like to take all of the question taking or would you like to alternate between virtual questions and in-person questions? I think it'd probably be smoother if you were willing to, to do both. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Why don't we start with the question virtually? There is not currently a hand up in the virtual arena, but please feel free to raise your hand. So you go to the reaction button, hit raise hand, and we'll call on you. Excellent. Why don't, why don't we see if there are any questions here in the room? I, I see Peggy McManus. Please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question, Peggy. Yes, I, I had a question about the use of Medicaid administrative dollars uh, for uh, kind of uh, thinking through the uh, workforce issues that are going on. And also in this discussion also to imagine the adult workforce that needs to be receiving uh, this uh, population going forward. So the question is really about the potential use of administrative dollars. Thank you. I'll start, Steve. Um, so Medicaid administrative dollars are run through the state at a FFP, federal fund participation rate. So you still have to have state dollars. And in some ways, the state, if the state's willing to commit the dollars, the Medicaid will put the, the federal money will come and flow. I don't want to say automatically, but pretty close to that if, it, if there's a purpose. So yeah, those dollars, it can be a multiplier for states. Um, it, the rate at which it's done is usually the state, um, can be the state rate for its FMAP, its regular match, or like, I know this because of I was a physician there that physician services are 75% federal. So if you can get it under the Medicaid medical director, the state only has to come up with a quarter of the money, which can sometimes be a good deal, but you have to decide what you're, what it's going to be used for. Um, and then just one other thing for Peggy is there's been programs like the state innovation model program where there's been big chunks of money that have come with less state responsibility, but the states really struggle with even the state portion of that money. And they, depending on what state you're in, they struggle more or less with that. But if, if, so I guess another way of looking at this is there can be issues that the state is engaged in or work that the state is engaged in that has an impact on Medicaid. And so there's opportunity and you have to go through the right hoops and create the right agreements. And sometimes it's contractual. But, um, and for physicians, it's 75%, but for most, for most staff and for contracts, it's 50%. But still, if you had, for instance, as Peggy asked, if there was, say, um, a workforce issue and where there was a significant need on the part of the Medicaid agency to have enough workers to be providing in-home care, whether skilled or unskilled, and to help to enhance that workforce, there's an opportunity there for some Medicaid money to help subsidize this. So, you know, especially in public health, there can be a lot of activities and functions going on that if you, if there was a Medicaid purpose, a legitimate Medicaid purpose, there would be the basis, even if you had to cost allocate it, to get some federal money for what would otherwise be paid for by 100% state funds. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have any questions here in the room? Hey, 
Hey Meg, this is Kara. I just wanted to add one thought on that ARPA um, question, or we're just one. Thank you, Kara. Sort of thing, just on the sustainability. You know, it, it brings back around. Like it's been, you know, wonderful in a public health emergency to have this infusion, this bump, right? But it goes away. <laughs> So we're back at, you know, and I've heard several Medicaid, you know, agencies say, well, what, you know, like all the work <laughs> to then go away and it takes years to implement and then the time's up and stuff. So, you know, it's back to almost a different, you know, demonstration again, rather than, you know, consistent change. So, so I saw some hands go up in the room. I saw Rhonda's first. Um, and also that just reminds me if you all could also state your name, um, ahead of time, because not everyone will uh, be able to see you. So my question is, we've been talking about Medicaid. We have this lovely meeting at the American, American Academy of Pediatrics talking about Medicaid. But our children with medical complexity are going into young adults with medical complexity. In the adult system, so we now we're dealing with Medicare, dual eligibles, and also adult health systems that have a very different philosophy of care and aren't equipped. Thinking about our next steps, how, where, do we, where do we start with that piece? Thank you, Rhonda. Would any of the panelists like to tackle that? I'm gonna say one quick thing, Rhonda, and I agree, I think we all agree, and that's that I think I'm hopeful I'm always an optimist that if we can start to measure what happens in transition better, it'll get, it'll get better attention um, because we don't we have terrible measures. You know, we have measures of whether we sent referrals, not whether or not they were received and, and they actually did anything. So I'm just going to, there's a zillion things to say, like, is it fair that EPSDT stops at 21? No, you know, it's not fair, but but I just want to say that if, if we can just start to acknowledge that we don't, we don't really, we really haven't put enough effort into the measurement that might be able to start. And I just want to say a quick thing, and that is, <clears throat> I think it's really important. I think the system does not do well at all by the population as they age. But I want to get back to the focus. We haven't got things done in terms of systems of care for children with special health care needs when they're under 21. And so I think, I mean, it depends on where you sit in the system, but I think you got to pick which battle you're going to focus on and focus on that. And so I think hopefully there are adult physicians who are committed to this population who are willing to fight that war. But the war I'm involved in, I think, or the battle relates to children with medical complexity and getting policy and financing done. And that's where I would urge we keep the focus. Thank you, Steve. I think that we may have time for one more question. So let's turn to the virtual audience. I see Meg, Rahel Barhani's hand up. Sorry, Meg, can I real quick comment on that last question that real something, one thought on the um, transition stuff, if I can real quick, just you know, the, I think the challenge like this again is where there's different prongs of looking at it. You know, at the at the individual at the systems level, it is that linking up between child, you know, pediatric providers and adult providers. But in a policy level, there's so much focus on what's done for adults with disabilities, coupled with elderly, and children are left as an afterthought in terms of policy. And theoretically, they're included. Um, and I think. Steve raises such a really critical point that, you know, is the direction to go to say, no, we have got to really finally fully invest in children. We have this magical tool of EPSDT and people do not know what it is and do not know how to do it. We don't need any more. We just need this to be fulfilled and really focus on children. Um, or is it that we need to really do life course, right? Because a child grows up and that is all connected along the way. It seems like we have these silos in policy and, and the adult with disability and elderly silo is ginormous. And um, the kid one is, is a little bit smaller and then there's absolutely no bridge, you know, and transition, they're absolutely dumped out. So just my quick thoughts, sorry for interrupting them. Not at all, Kara, thank you for that, that was helpful. Um, 
I'd like to invite my colleague Peggy McManus, who, who asked a question earlier, to put the, the web link for Got Transition in the chat box if she has a second. Um, I highly encourage those of you who are interested in transition to access their resources. They're really outstanding. Um, and um, you'll find a wealth of information on the website. So thank you. If you have a moment, Peggy, that'd be great. Um, let's go ahead and turn to Rahel for one quick question, and then we're going to need to wrap up and get to break. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you for a great discussion. I just want to hear the thoughts of all the panelists on on how what kind of policy opportunities do we have to bring children's hospitals, especially quaternary children's hospital, as part of this solution? You know, the system has to, they, they are part of the ecosystem. We don't want to recreate some separate thing. They are, for better or for worse, families definitely use them. They're the ones that recruit all of the specialists in the community. Most of them subsidize the complex care clinics, despite the disincentives involved, the perverse incentives. But they are responsible for what happens in their walls, what happens to the person that comes in there and gets care, and not what happens after the children live leave the, the, the hospitals. How, what policy and payment structures would support and incentivize children's hospitals to be uh, to take to have a stake in making sure that families stay whole, children stay whole no matter what happens, uh, not just in, in, in the hospital but after they go home. Thank you, Rahel. I'm going to ask one of our panelists if they can tackle this question, and then we're going to move to the next part of our, our agenda. I always seem to have something to say, Rahel, but it's a great question. I guess a couple things. One is we need to have separate the payment incentives for complex care clinics from the, from the, as you said, perverse payment incentives for children's hospitals. And so we, the ACO models, the fast, the, the, Maybe the best way to do that if you have an ACO that actually can, act, can address that. And then I would say that we need to have care model expectations for kids with complex needs in those tertiary care facilities. So we had um, Tim from Wisconsin talk at the National Care Coordination Academy, and he talked about rounding as from the complex care. So we have to have some some expectations as well. And I think that's where we need to go. We could talk a lot later or more offline about financing of hospitals and whether it's done the right way either. But I think that, that those are some thoughts. Thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, I'd like to ask you all to join me now in thanking our panelists for a terrific hour together. I, I learned a lot as I always do whenever I get a chance to listen to these three and their wisdom. Um, let's, uh, let's thank them for their work. We're going to move now into a short 10 minute break. Um, there are refreshments in the back of the room for those of you who are here with us in person. I hope those of you who are here with us virtually have something yummy in your fridge. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll reassemble here, uh, in 10 minutes for, uh, a welcome and some remarks from uh, Dr. Warren with the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. So I, I please do encourage you all to be back on time for that. Thank you.